They were messing with his travel arrangements, trying to get him here. He then had to try to drive down here from New Jersey. And then unfortunately, he had a car accident. He's fine, but his car is not. And as if you've tried to rent a car, you can just forget about it. So unfortunately, he couldn't get down here. So uh, Pat Navarros and the guys up there in the AV and uh, Jay worked real quick, made sure they got all set up for Zoom so he could actually do his presentation on Zoom. So you're going to see him tonight on the big screen on Zoom. People at home are going to see him on Zoom. So we're going to do it that way. And then next month, we'll be back to the normal presentation. And that's why we got a sparse crowd. We tried to get the word out to everybody, but it wasn't until three o'clock that we could get a, a mass email out to everybody. So we knew you weren't gonna get the word, but that's the best we can hope for, okay? So I'm glad that everybody that could make it. And for those that are home, uh, enjoy your time here. Just have a great time talking to your friends. Um, as you well know, we have the ladies forum. Uh, all the ladies, uh, would you please stand up that participated or worked on the forum? Next slide, please. Sharon, please stand up. Sharon and Ian and Barb and which one of the ladies worked on the forum. And we had over 60 ladies attend this forum. We are the only round table in the country that has a separate forum for the women. Nobody else does. Everybody else wants to copy us, but they haven't done it yet. Next slide. Um, 30 people the weekend before the forum went out and got a great tour with Chris Fonville at the Sugarloaf uh, Defensive Line. If you've ever been with Chris, you've got to walk fast and you better be paying attention because he keeps talking and talking and talking and talking and you can't shut him up, but you better be walking to try to listen and catch up because he's not slowing down. And he's an old guy. But everybody had a great time. 30 people went on that tour. You can go on that tour. It's easy to get to. I talk about it in uh, the newsletter. It's easy to get to. It's right there in the public's parking lot, a big sign, you can see it. So it's real easy to do. Next slide. We put it in the newsletter next month. We got a vote on the bylaws. So just read the bylaws so you know what you're voting on. There's some suggested changes in there we thought that was needed. We've been working on this for a number of years and we finalized that. So we're gonna talk about that next month. Next slide, Jack, you would come up. Good evening. Good evening, is that better? my wife. Okay. Um, I'm the uh, chairman of the nominating committee and this is about the fourth or fifth time I've done this. And I've been equally unsuccessful every year. We don't have new people coming in and saying, let's do this. Let's get the office to be vice president of the thing. So uh, I have to start working on that. Next year, I'm proud of people up here, but the same name, people who want to in. So, this is our slate that we have. It's a water and a search, and uh, the good people have been working hard, but now some of those experienced leaders who can take over. So, Election will be at uh, December meeting, and uh, anybody have any questions? Phone numbers been out there, but who's on the 
Next slide, please. Okay, this is something interesting that's going to happen on the weekend of 13 and 14 November. They're going to unveil the U.S. Colored Troops statue at the Cameron Museum. It is very unusual that a museum will have anything to do with the Civil War battlefield or statue. This roundtable donated $5,000 towards this statue and the other things that go with it. Bench and some other things. So, next slide. If you're interested, the unveiling is on the 13th at 11 o'clock. They've got all kinds of things going on all day on the 13th there at the Cameron Museum. They got all kinds of things on the 14th. So it's basically a family affair. You bring the family. Uh, if, if you had, if in this crowd, you don't have little kids, but if you had kids, they've made it kid friendly. They actually have battlefield and fortification pieces there at the Cameron Museum, and that's how uh, they convinced him to use it. Chris Fonville was all part of the effort to make them do this. So um, they're doing a great job. One of the things that they did that's kind of interesting for this, they used relatives and other people that were reenactors re and some other people to model the faces of the statues. So they took a lot of care to go back and do that. So it ought to be pretty interesting. If you want to do it, look it up at the Cameron Museum. It's 11 o'clock on the 13th is the actual unveiling, but they got stuff going on all day on the 13th and the 14th activities over there. Uh, next slide. Something to watch for in the email in the next couple of weeks, we're going to do a survey. We're going to ask your opinion about a couple of things, trying to make some improvements, add some things, do things like that. So look for that. Next slide, 50-50. All right, first ticket, 63 bucks. 191074. 191074. Who's got it? Okie dokie. All right, the next ticket is for a book at the Sutler's table. 191191. 191191. Anybody got that one? Okay. So you can see uh, Peter over there at the Sutler's table, get you a free book and all that good stuff. All right. Next slide. Uh, Gar's gonna come up and introduce our speaker. I think you're gonna enjoy this program by Jay. Gar. Uh, we have speaking tonight, Jay Jorgensen. Uh, if you have read his bio behind, multifaceted person. He's a historian, author, is a family court judge. Uh, what it doesn't say up there is that while he was at Farley Dickinson University, he was also a basketball player, captain of the team, and twice was named academic All-American. It was also with basketball at Farley Dickinson that he incurred the wrath of the legendary basketball coach at Indiana University, Bobby Knight. Bobby was at 
Harley Dickinson uh, for a clinic. Uh, being captain of the team, Jay was asked to come onto the court and perform a short drill. As is the way with Jay, he did a spectacular job of doing the drill, which was not without another else. At which point he took Jay aside and let him know in no uncertain terms that he screwed up the deal. So that puts Jay in the neighborhood of probably hundreds of college basketball referees who have been told that they've done the same thing that he has been told to. So talking tonight about the top 10 turning points of the Civil War, we have Jay Jordanson. Thank you very much, Gar. I hope that uh, everybody can hear me. Um, I'm very sorry that I can't be with you tonight. Uh, as John indicated, I was initially ready to fly down uh, on United Airlines. They canceled one of my flights, uh, and then I decided I would drive down. I left my house at about 5.30 this morning, and about uh, inside of half hour on the Jersey Turnpike, I uh, had a problem with uh, a, a large piece of metal uh, attaching itself to my uh, one of my tires and, and had a blowout, so I couldn't be with you. And, I, and I'm really sorry that I couldn't be with you because uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I'd, li I'd like to do is something that uh, has been recommended to me by Jerry Russell. I don't know if any of you folks know about Jerry Russell. Jerry was a, the originator and founder of the Civil War Roundtable of uh, Arkansas back in the 60s, but also was the uh, guiding light behind the Civil War Roundtables Associates uh, and really got involved with the battlefield preservation. Uh, Jerry came to our roundtable in New Jersey uh, about 25 years ago and uh, he told me, he says, you know, when, when you go to speak to roundtables, what you should try to do is get there a little bit early and find out some information about the area. Uh, and so well, Jerry had done that when he had come to New Jersey, apparently he said that he found a letter in the archives uh, down in Trenton, New Jersey, our capital. And, uh, and he told us about it at the Battlefield Preservation Dinner. He said that there was uh, a regiment uh, from uh, uh, Richmond, uh, Richmond area in Virginia, uh, that uh, after the war, about 15 years after the war, they decided they were going to uh, raise a, a monument to themselves. And they thought it would be a good idea to invite back uh, to the Richmond area a uh, regiment from Massachusetts that they had fought against several times in battles during the Civil War. And so they invited the, the, uh, the, the Massachusetts uh, veterans back down to Richmond and they came down for the unveiling. And they had, uh, it was kind of a, an opportunity to get, get both sides back. Well, two years later, the Massachusetts regiment thought it was such a wonderful idea that when they were unveiling a, a monument themselves up in the Massachusetts area, they decided to invite the uh, Richmond veteran, the, the, the Richmond, Virginia veterans up there. Of course, that was a problem because uh, back then, you know, the uh, to get from uh, Virginia down to, up to Massachusetts, you have to go through the state, the garden state of uh, New Jersey. And apparently there was a woman uh, in uh, one of the counties in Somerset County, uh, a, a Mrs. Brown, who took the umbrage to that. Uh, and rightfully so, perhaps, because her, her husband and, and three of her four sons were killed during the Civil War. But Mrs. Brown was, was aghast that the, these Confederates were going to be coming through the, the, the state of New Jersey. And so she started writing a letter campaign. She wrote, sent a letter to the President of the United States, the Governor of New Jersey, the state senators and state assemblymen from New Jersey. And she said essentially that it was, she was appalled that the Confederates would be coming up into her state and passing through her state and she was demanding that that not be permitted. Well, apparently, according to this letter, according to Jerry Russell, uh, there was only one state senator uh, who responded to Mrs. Brown. And he said uh, in the letter, and this is the letter that Jerry purportedly found, he said, uh, Mrs. Brown, I, I can certainly understand uh, where you're coming from, uh, having lost, your, lost your, your husband and three of your four sons. Uh, but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, that there are some good Confederates, and in, in fact, I'm I'm pretty sure that there are some Confederates uh, who have passed away that that are in heaven, 
and so Mrs. Brown, if you don't want it to uh, associate with Confederates, well, then you can just go to hell. And so uh, that was uh, Jerry's uh, uh, take on, 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 on uh, going out and finding things. So my topic tonight is, is the top 10 uh, turning points in the Civil War. And uh, in, in the top 10 turning points in the Civil War, this is my top 10. Uh, the, the nice thing about this is I've, I've had an opportunity to present this to other roundtables is uh, everybody gets to pick their own top 10 uh, turning points in the Civil War. Uh, top turning points are, are significant events uh, having a, a major impact uh, on the war and a major impact on the outcome of the war. And so uh, that's what I uh, tried to do. Uh, and hopefully uh, you will, will, will agree with some of the uh, points that I have. I'm sure that there's going to be some of my points that you're going to disagree about. Uh, but I hope at the end of the uh, end of the night that you'll think, uh, you know what, uh, it might be time for me to think about my own uh, top 10 turning points in the Civil War. So let's start with the first one, and that's the, the Battle of uh, Bull Run. Of course, everybody remembers on uh, April 12th of uh, 1861, uh, the uh, Confederates in Charleston Harbor opened up uh, fire on Fort Sumter, uh, which was manned by, by Union forces. Um, as a result uh, of the capitulation of Fort Sumter on the, the following day, Abraham Lincoln, President Abraham Lincoln in the United States, called on all the states uh, to send forces to, uh, in order to uh, raise some forces to recapture the fort and other federal property. Now, in, in April of 1861, at the outset of the Civil War, the regular army of the United States of America consisted of approximately only 16,000 officers uh, and soldiers uh, that had been organized into 10 regiments of infantry, four uh, of artillery, two of cavalry, and two of dragoons, and had one mounted rifle uh, regiment. These regiments were mostly posted uh, in small forts of company size detachments, and the majority of these were posted west of the Mississippi River. Now, when the war began with the firing on Fort Sumter, most Americans expected that the conflict was going to be very brief. Uh, and so when President Lincoln called upon the governors and the states uh, in the Union uh, to furnish him, he only requested 75,000 soldiers, and he asked for an enlistment of only 90 days. Uh, of course, when the Confederacy moved its uh, capital uh, up to Richmond, Virginia, uh, only 100 miles from the Washington, D.C. capital, uh, everyone expected that it would be a decisive battle, and it would take place on the ground somewhere between uh, those two capitals. Of course, uh, everybody also expected that uh, by Christmas, the war would be over. So the boys going off to war in April and May and June, uh, they'd be back. Uh, they'd be back by the end of, of, of uh, 1861. Uh, Lincoln's army had completed almost its entire 90-day enlistment requirement. And still its field commander, the, it was uh, General uh, Irvin McDowell. Uh, McDowell was reluctant to uh, bring on an engagement. Uh, at 42 years old, he was a career army officer, uh, but despite the fact that uh, he had a couple decades of military service, this newly minted commander of the Department of Northeastern Virginia, which is what his army was titled back then, like so many officers of 1861, they had never led a large body of soldiers uh, in battle. Uh, now, while Lincoln and his cabinet members uh, were listening uh, to uh, a briefing from uh, General McDowell, McDowell laid out a plan to attack the 24,000 man Confederate army, which was uh, under the command of uh, Brigadier General uh, with the great name, Pierre, uh, there's McDowell. Uh, he, he decided that they would uh, bring, their, bring the battle against uh, Pierre Gustave Toutain Beauregard, who's in charge of the Army of the Potomac. And, Beauregard was, was the uh, the hero of the Confederate States of America at the time, for he was the one that led the forces uh, uh, that uh, took over uh, Fort Sumter. Uh, but it was McDowell's idea to attack the 24,000 uh, man army that uh, Beauregard had uh, near the winding Bull Run Creek, which was about 25 miles uh, southwest of Washington, uh, D.C. McDowell intended to use about 30,000 troops in the effort. He would march uh, in three separate columns, and he'd have another 10,000 men held in reserve. Now, with, with such numerical superiority, it appeared that McDowell would overwhelm his uh, southern counterpart. Meanwhile, there, there are 15,000 federal troops under an aging veteran, Major General 
Robert Patterson. They were stationed in the lower Shenandoah Valley, and they were tasked there with uh, trying to uh, prevent a Confederate force uh, combined of about 11,000 soldiers under the command of General Joseph Johnson uh, from slipping out from the uh, valley and reinforcing Beauregard near the vital uh, rail link of, Mass of Manassas Junction. Now, uh, McDowell's plan was a complex plan, especially for an, a very inexperienced army. And uh, even McDowell had some reservations about uh, taking the offensive. Although some of Lincoln's advisors questioned Patterson's ability uh, to be able to hold Johnson in the valley, nevertheless, the plan was ultimately approved. Uh, pressed by rather political rather than military considerations, that is, you've got these uh, uh, soldiers that have uh, signed up for 90 days and their enlistments were coming uh, soon coming over. Uh, McDowell's army, they started west uh, on July 16th and they made slow but, but steady progress toward their rendezvous, rendezvous uh, with uh, Beauregard's army. Meanwhile, uh, in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, General Joseph Johnson's uh, Southerners were moving across the mountains to reinforce Beauregard, uh, largely because of, of uh, General Patterson's inaction. Uh, the normally cautious uh, General Joseph Johnson was able to march to Piedmont Junction where his troops boarded cars on the Manassas Gap Railroad uh, beginning at about 8 o'clock in the morning on July 20th, there was a steady stream of uh, Southern troops began arriving at Manassas Junction. Uh, and this was unknown to McDowell. Uh, Brigadier General Thomas Jonathan Jackson's brigade was the first brigade uh, to make the trip out of the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, before the battle would end the following day, three additional brigades uh, from the Shenandoah Valley reached the field and they all play a, a key role. Uh, in defeating McDowell at the Battle uh, of First Manassas. Uh, there also, in fact, were hundreds of reporters and congressional representatives and other civilians that had traveled from Washington, D.C. in very ca carriages and on horses. Uh, they went out to see a real battle. Uh, now, it took the Northern troops two and a half days to march the only 25 miles. Beauregard uh, had been warned uh, of McDowell's troop movement as a result of a Southern belle by the name of Betty Duval. Uh, Betty uh, concealed a message in her hair uh, informing, uh, uh, informing Beauregard of this. Betty was a, uh, one of Rose Greenhouse uh, uh, messenger, uh, Green, Rose Greenhouse being a, a famed Confederate spy working out of Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, and so uh, as a result of that, uh, Beauregard is going to consolidate his forces along the south bank of Bull Run, which is a river of a few, few miles north of Manassas Junction, and waited there for the Union troops of McDowell to arrive. Now, early on July 21st, uh, the first battle of Bull Run or the first battle of Manassas began. Uh, as you all know, the, uh, uh, the uh, Confederates would uh, named their battles uh, generally uh, uh, after the land that, that was fought over, while the Union uh, generally uh, named their battles after water. So we have uh, Shiloh, uh, the Confederate version of uh, Pittsburgh Landing uh, by the Union, uh, or for example, Sharpsburg and, uh, and Antietam, uh, or Murfreesboro and, and Stone River. So we have the first battle of Bull Run or the first battle of Manassas. Now, during the first two hours of the battle, 4,500 Confederates gave ground grudgingly to 10,000 Union soldiers. But as the Confederates were retreating, they found a brigade of fresh troops led by Thomas Jackson waiting just over the crest of a hill. Trying to rally his uh, infantry, General Bernard B. from South Carolina shouted, look, there's Jackson with his Virginias standing like a stone wall. And so the Southern troops held firm. And Jackson's nickname, Stonewall, uh, was born. First bull run to that battle was a clash between relatively large and ill-trained bodies of recruits led by inexperienced officers. Neither army commander was able to deploy his forces effectively in this battle, although there was nearly 60,000 armed men present in the area, only 18,000 had actually uh, been engaged. Bull Run was the largest as well as the bloodiest battle in the United States history up to that date. Uh, Union casualties were 460 killed, uh, 1,100 uh, wounded, and 1,300 missing or captured, while the Confederates had 387 killed, uh, 1,600 wounded, and 13 missing. Now, the 
federal army's retreat uh, was initially calm and it was relatively well organized. Uh, however, it became less so with fears of Confederate cavalry and uh, accurately aimed cannon fire. There were hundreds of men were scooped up, including a congressman, uh, Alfred Eli from New York. Uh, most of the troops finally found their way to safety, uh, but they were depressed and safety was at Washington. They were depressed and worn out by their long day. In truth, many of these sightseers uh, had, 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 had uh, packed picnic baskets to go out uh, to see what was up. Uh, near Centerville, uh, Virginia Captain John Tidball witnessed uh, a throng of sightseers approach his battery. He said, they came in all manner of ways, some in stylish carriages, others in city hacks, and still others in buggies on horseback and even on foot. Apparently everything in the shape of vehicles in and around Washington had been pressed into service for the occasion. It was a Sunday and everybody seemed to have taken a general holiday. That is all the male population for I saw none of the other sex there except a few huckster women who had driven out in carts loaded with pies and other edibles. All manner of people were representing this crowd from the most grave and noble senators to hotel waiters. Ultimately, these uh, curiosity seekers got caught up in, this, in the stampede of uh, retreating Union troops. Now, the battle's over. The Northern public was shocked at the unexpected defeat of this, their army. Uh, they had anticipated an easy victory uh, and that didn't happen. Both sides quickly then came to the realization this war is gonna be longer and more brutal than they had imagined. Lincoln would then sign a bill that provided for the enlistment of another 500,000 men uh, for up to three years of service for each of those. The reaction in the Confederacy was, was more muted. Uh, there was little public celebration as the Southerners realized that despite their victory, and it was a Confederate victory, the greater battles that uh, would inevitably come would mean greater losses uh, for their side as well. And then once the euphoria of victory had been worn off, Jefferson Davis called for 400,000 additional volunteers. Of course, the next day, uh, or soon thereafter, uh, Lincoln uh, named Major General George Brinton McClellan uh, to command the new Army of the Potomac. The effect of the battle at the time was surprising for both the Confederate States and the United, in the United States. To begin with, it established that the uh, true face of war and gave both sides a glimpse at how bloody the war would be. Moreover, both the North and the South believed that the war would be quick and short, uh, and the North, they believed that the uh, Union Army would quickly decimate the Confederates and the Confederacy would come back with its tail between its legs, so to speak, and the Union would thus be restored. Uh, the first battle of Bull Run extinguished that idea. On a smaller note, the battle also showed how unprepared the armies were. But in order to prosecute this war, both sides would have to make hard decisions and confront hard choices. Uh, the conventional wisdom was that the boys would be home by Christmas, as they indicated. First battle of Manassas uh, showed the utter folly of, of that thinking. Number two, my second turning point of the Civil War, George McClellan takes command. Now, McClellan, born December 13th of, uh, of December 3rd, rather, of 1826, was born in Philadelphia. Uh, he was the son of a common surgeon, Dr. George McClellan. Uh, Dr. George McClellan was the founder of Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia. McClellan also was the great grandson of a Revolutionary War uh, general by the name of Samuel McClellan from Woodstock, Connecticut. McClellan attended the University of Pennsylvania in 1840, beginning in 1840 at the age of 13. Now, McClellan resigned himself to the study of law. Uh, after two years, however, uh, he changed his mind and he changed his goal to military service. And so with the assistance of his father's letter to uh, President uh, John Tyler, young George McClellan was accepted at the United States Military Academy uh, in 1842. And George was uh, 15 years old. And so the academy had to waive its normal minimum, minimum age of 16. McClellan graduated in the famous class of uh, 1846. He was second in his class of 59 cadets. Uh, he lost out to the top spot position to Charles Seaport Stewart, only because uh, McClellan was uh, at Fort Drawings to kill. McClellan, McClellan would serve, serve with distinction in the Mexican-American War from uh, 1847. Okay, 
So uh, McClellan uh, would then ultimately begin courting his, his future wife, uh, Mary Ellen Marcy, uh, who was uh, 10 years his junior. She was the daughter of his, uh, one of his former commanders. Ellen, or, or Nellie, as she liked to be called, refused McClellan's first proposal of marriage. Uh, apparently, she was uh, quite the bell because she received a total of nine uh, offers to marriage for a variety of suitors, including uh, McClellan's West Point friend, Ambrose, Ambrose Powell Hill. Ellen actually had accepted Hill's uh, proposal in 1856, but uh, her family did not approve of that, and so uh, he had to withdraw his proposal. Now, because of his political connections and his mastery of French, McClellan received the assignment to be an official observer of the European armies in the Crimean War in 1855. And so he traveled widely and he interacted with the highest military commands and royal families, was able to observe the siege of Sevastopol. Now, upon his return to the United States in 1856, uh, McClellan requested an assignment uh, in Philadelphia in order to prepare his report. And that report contained a, a critical analysis of the siege of Sevastopol, as well as a lengthy description of the organization of the European armies. He also wrote a manual on cavalry, uh, cavalry tactics that was based on Russian cavalry regulation. The army would adopt McClellan's cavalry manual, and it also was designed for a saddle, which is dubbed as the McClellan saddle. Uh, which he claimed to have been used by the Hussars in Prussia and in Hungary. Now, that saddle, the McClellan saddle, became the standard issue for as long as the United States Horse Cavalry existed and is still used for uh, ceremonies uh, of the army. McClellan would resign his commission in January of 1857, and capitalizing on his experience with the railroad assessment, he became the chief engineer and the vice president of the Illinois Central Railroad, and then uh, he became the president of the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad in 1860. The year before, in October of 1859, he resumed his courtship of Mary Ellen, uh, and they were married uh, in New York City on May 22nd of 1860. Now, after the defeat of the Union Army uh, forces at Bull Run on July 21st, Lincoln summoned McClellan from the Western Virginia, where McClellan had actually given the North the only engagements bearing any semblance of victory. Uh, so he would travel, McClellan would travel by a special train on the uh, main Pennsylvania line from Wheeling uh, through Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and Baltimore and on to Washington, D.C. And he was greeted by enthusiastic crowds uh, that, that would uh, meet the train along, along that route. The day after he reached the capital, which was, uh, he reached the capital on July 26th, he was appointed the commander of the military division of the Potomac which was the main Union force responsible for the defense of Washington, D.C. Uh, on August 20th, several military units in Virginia were consolidated into his department, and McClellan then immediately uh, named and formed and named it the uh, Army of the Potomac. Now, uh, with himself uh, as his first commander, he reveled in the newly acquired power and influence. Uh, he would write a letter he said, to his uh, wife, uh, and he would say, I find myself in a new and strange position here. President, cabinet, General Scott, and all deferring to me. By some strange operation of magic, I seem to have become the power of the land. I almost think that were I to win some small success now, I could become dictator or anything else that might please me. But nothing of that kind would please me. Therefore, I won't be dictator. Admirable self-denial. Uh, that's a letter to, uh, he wrote uh, George to his wife uh, on July 26th of 1861. Now, I'm a family court judge, and I'm pretty convinced that um, uh, Mary Ellen did not have all that great uh, of uh, uh, feelings for her husband because she kept all of McClellan's letters, and all of his letters are similar to this, and, and then she, uh, uh, after he passed away, uh, they were all published, and uh, these are, are not fl very flattering letters uh, for George McClellan. Nevertheless, uh, now during the summer and the fall, McClellan brought a high degree of organization to his new army. That was what he was really good at. Uh, he greatly improved the morale. He made fr frequent trips in order to review the troops and encourage his units. Uh, and in fact, it, it was a remarkable achievement uh, in which he came to personify the Army of the Potomac. 
and reap the, the adulation uh, of the men uh, in the ranks. Uh, he would write and, and thought very highly, uh, and it was very protective of his men. Uh, he wrote his troops on, July, on June 6th, uh, June 1st, rather, 1862. You are now face to face with the rebels who are at bay in front of their capital. The final and decisive battle is at hand. He asked for one last crowning effort, pledging that soldiers, I will be with you in this battle and share its dangers with you. It was greeted by many loud cheers and by the rank and file. Uh, then uh, a month later, July 4th of 1862, at Harrison's Landing, uh, McClellan to his troops, attacked by vastly superior forces and without hope of reinforcements, you have succeeded in changing your base of operations by a flank movement always regarded as the most hazardous of military expedients. You have saved all your material, all your trains, and all your guns, except a few lost in battle. Your conduct ranks you among the celebrated armies of history. Now, this is at the conclusion of the Seven Days Battle. Uh, and at the beginning of uh, June of 1862, when he wrote that first letter, uh, his army was about six or seven miles outside of, Peter, uh, outside of Richmond, capital of the Confederacy. But July 4th, uh, he had been pushed back through the uh, peninsula, and uh, Lee had the upper hand at that point. But McClellan, uh, his influence is why I think he is a, one of the turning points is because of his organization. He established military boards in order to examine the qualifications of volunteer officers. He widened the use of uh, court martial. He equipped the artillery arm with material and competent officers. Uh, he developed uh, an extremely good esprit de corps and had special duty assignments for force. He also created defenses for Washington that were almost impregnable. They, they consisted of 48 forts and strong points with 480 guns manned by 7,200 artillery. The Army of the Potomac grew in number from 50,000 uh, 50, men uh, to 168,000 men in November of 1861, becoming the largest military force the United States had raised up until that time. Now, although McClellan was meticulous uh, in his planning and his preparations, uh, those, those characteristics hampered his ability to challenge aggressive opponents uh, in a fast moving battlefield environment. Uh, he chronically overestimated the strength of enemy units and was reluctant to apply principles of uh, mass frequently leaving large portions of his army unengaged at decisive points. He organized and led the Union Army in that peninsula campaign, as I, as I indicated. Uh, and he was initially successful against the somewhat cautious General Joseph Johnson. Uh, but the military emergence of uh, Robert E. Lee to command the Army of Northern Virginia turned the subsequent Seven Days Battle into a uh, partial Union defeat. At, uh, when Lee in invaded uh, after the second battle, of sec uh, uh, second battle of Bull Run, Lee invaded Maryland and Pennsylvania in the Antietam campaign, uh, hoping to collect supplies in Union territory and possibly win a victory that would sway the upcoming Union elections in favor of ending the war. But the phone's men had actually found the lost Confederate dispatch uh, with the Special Order 191, and that revealed Lee's plans and movements. And the phone always exaggerated Lee's numerical strength. But now we knew that the Confederate army was divided and could be destroyed in detail. And yet the following, unfortunately, always moved slowly. And it was, didn't realize as spy and informally that uh, George had, had the plan. So he quickly concentrated his forces west of the Antietam Creek uh, near Sharpsburg, Maryland, where the following attack on September 17th. Uh, ultimately, there would be a victory, uh, well, there would be a draw uh, there. As a result of the, uh, the draw, really at Antietam, um, uh, Lincoln named Ambrose Burnside as commander of the Army of the Potomac. Uh, McClellan ultimately would come on to uh, become the uh, unsuccessful uh, Democratic Party nominee in the 1864 presidential election against Lee, uh, against Lincoln, rather, uh, and would serve as the 24th governor of my home state, uh, New Jersey, from 1878 to 1881. But the, the reason for my opinion that uh, the appointment of McClellan as commander uh, was a turning point because of the importance in developing the Army of the Potomac and bringing order to a chaotic situation. 
Turning point number three, the death of Albert Sidney Johnson. Uh, Johnson was born on February 2nd of 1803 and served as a general in three different uh, armies, the Texan Army, which was from the Republic of Texas, uh, the United States Army, and also the Confederate States Army. In 1826, Johnson graduated eighth out of 41 cadets from West Point and received a commission uh, as brevet second lieutenant. He fought in the Mexican-American War uh, under General Zachary Taylor as a colonel of the first Texas Rifle Volunteer. In 1855, President Franklin Pierce appointed him Colonel of the newly created 2nd U.S. Cavalry. Uh, the second in command for that cavalry unit uh, was none other than Robert Lee. Now, at the outbreak of the, uh, the uh, Civil War, Johnson was the commander of the U.S. Army Department of the Pacific, located uh, out in California. In that summer of 61, uh, Davis, Jefferson Davis, appointed several generals to defend the Confederate lines from the Mississippi River uh, east to the Allegheny Mountains. And on September 10th of 1861, Johnson was assigned uh, to command the huge area of the Confederacy west of the Allegheny Mountains, uh, except for the coastal area. He became the commander of the Confederacy's Western armies in the area which is often called the Western Department or the Western Military Department. Johnson's appointment as a full general by his friend and admirer, Jefferson Davis, already had been confirmed by the Confederate Senate on August 31st of that year. The appointment was backdated to rank from May 30th of 1861, taking Albert Sidney Johnson, the second highest ranking general in the Confederate States Army, first only Adjutant General Inspector Samuel Cooper uh, ranked ahead of him. Uh, Johnson would concentrate forces uh, in the Corinth, Mississippi area, uh, in 1862 and spring of 1862. Uh, he decided that uh, he would uh, bring, bring together those forces under the command of uh, Polk and uh, Beauregard. Uh, and he had about 17,000 men uh, giving a, of his own, giving a combined force of about 40 to 45,000 men in Corinth, uh, in Corinth area. On May 29th of 1862, Johnson officially took command of that combined force now. He planned to defeat the Union forces on a piecemeal basis uh, before the various Union units in Kentucky and Tennessee under the command of uh, U.S. Grant with about 40,000 men uh, located near Pittsburgh Landing, Tennessee, and Major General Carlos Buell on, uh, was on his way from Nashville, Tennessee with 35,000 men. Before those two could, could unite, it was Johnson's uh, belief that he'd be able to beat both of them piecemeal. So he started his army in motion on April 3rd of 1862, uh, his intent was to surprise Grant's force uh, as soon as the next day, August, uh, April 4th. However, the Confederates moved slowly uh, as a result of their inexperience and bad roads and lack of adequate staff planning. Uh, due to those delays, as well as several contacts, brief contacts with the enemy, Johnson's second in command, none other than PGT Beauregard, felt that the element of surprise had been lost and recommended uh, calling off the attack. Johnson decided to proceed his plan, stating, I would fight them if I were a million, and tomorrow we'll water our horses in the Tennessee River. His army was finally positioned within a mile or two of Grant's force and undetected on the evening of April 5th, 1862. Uh, he launched a, a massive surprise attack and was concentrated forces against Grant at the Battle of Shiloh on April 6th, 1862. Johnson seemed to be everywhere personally leading and rallying troops up and down the line on his horse. At about 2.30 in the afternoon, while leading one of those charges uh, against the Union camp near the Peach Orchard, he was wounded. He took a bullet behind his right knee. Apparently, uh, he didn't think that the wound was serious at the time, or maybe even possibly, uh, he didn't feel it. And so he sent his personal physician away to attend to some wounded, captured Union soldiers instead. Uh, the bullet had, in fact, clipped a part of the popliteal artery, and his boot was filling up with blood. Now, among the Johnson's staff there at, Sh at the Battle of Shiloh was uh, I Isham Harris, who was the governor of Tennessee. Uh, seeing Johnson slumped in, the, in his saddle and face turning deathly pale, Governor Harris asked, General, are, are you wounded? Johnson glanced down at his leg wound and then faced Harris and fired in a weak voice his last words. Yes and I fear seriously. 
Harris and other staff officers removed Johnson from his horse. Uh, they carried him to a small ravine, ravine near the hornet's nest and uh, desperately tried to aid the general who had lost consciousness by this point. Harris then sent an aide to fetch Johnson's surgeon, uh, but he didn't apply a, a, a tourniquet to Johnson's wounded leg. Uh, before the doctor could be found, Johnson died from the blood loss uh, only a few moments later. He, Johnson, was the highest ranking fatality of the war on either side, uh, and his death was a strong blow to the morale of the Confederacy. At the time, President Jefferson Davis of the South considered Johnson to be the best general in the country and believed the loss of Albert Sidney Johnson, quote, when Albert Sidney Johnson fell, it was the turning point of our fate, for we had no other one to take up his work in the West. Davis also stated, if Sidney Johnson is not a general, we had better give up the war, for we have no general. As a result of this now, the Confederate attack lost momentum and eventually became halted. The next day, a reinforced federal army, you know, Don Carlos Buell made it uh, and, and hooked up with Grant's men. They would uh, together drive the Southerners from the field. Uh, the battle that promised so much for the Confederates ended up in a bitter defeat, made worse by the loss of the man upon whom rest, so much rest was so, so much hope. For the rest of the war, as a result now, for, uh, why this is an important turning point, for the rest of the war, Jefferson Davis had difficulty with effective command in the Western theater. Consequently, the stream of the less than stellar generals that were appointed, uh, none were up to the task of uh, fighting against either uh, U.S. Grant or uh, William Sherman. Fourth turning point, Robert E. Lee takes command of the Army of Northern Virginia. Born January 19th, 1807, he graduates number two in the West Point class of 1829, uh, behind that uh, trivia uh, answer, who was number one? Charles Mason, uh, the class of 1829. Uh, in the spring of 1862, in the, during the Peninsula Campaign, the Union Army of the Potomac under General McClellan had advanced on Richmond from Fort Monroe to the east. Uh, McClellan had actually forced uh, General Joe Johnson and the Army of Virginia to retreat to just north and east of the Confederate capital. Then, Joe Johnson was wounded in the Battle of Seven Pines. Uh, immediately taken over command then of the Army of Virginia was G.W. Smith, uh, replacing him on June 1st. Uh, at, uh, Jefferson Davis and arrived at, at Smith's headquarters at two o'clock in the afternoon that day and uh, amidst the retreating Confederate Army. Davis dismissed Smith and replaced him with Robert E. Lee. Now, up until now, uh, Lee had not had a field command of, 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 of event. Uh, early in the war in July and August of 1861, he was out in Western Virginia um, and, and had uh, a minimal uh, impact out there. Uh, he was then uh, shipped down to uh, observe the, uh, the coastal defenses in South Carolina uh, because of his attention for uh, fortifying and digging. Uh, he was receiving uh, nicknames, uh, Granny Lee, uh, the King of Spades. Uh, and so uh, he was recalled to back to Richmond and became, for lack of a better term, really uh, uh, Jefferson's uh, uh, chief military advisor. And so on June 1st of 1862, he finally gets field command. Uh, he immediately renames the Army of Virginia to the Army of Northern Virginia. Uh, letting letting the uh, soldiers the soldiers know where they intended to, to be fighting. Uh, that signaled a confidence uh, that the Union Army would be driven away from the Richmond uh, defenses. For the first three weeks of June, Lee didn't attack. Uh, instead, he strengthened up the uh, Richmond's defenses and tried to improve and, in fact, improve the morale of the Army of, of the Confederate Army. Uh, Lee's taking command uh, helped the overall organization. Uh, he provided uh, excellent leadership, he cared for the men, he strengthened the officers, uh, those that uh, weren't up to snuff, uh, they were uh, soon removed from the theater. Uh, and above all, Lee uh, had a, a pension for audacity. Edward Porter Alexander uh, had asked a friend, uh, has General Lee the audacity that's going to be required? And uh, Alexander's friend, his companion, Co Colonel uh, Joseph Ives responded, his name might be, might be audacity. He will take more desperate chances 
and take them quicker than any other general in this country, north or south, and you will live to see it too. And of course, Alexander did. That success that uh, Lee had had in, in, July, in June and early July of 1862, the Seven Days Campaign, completely changed the Confederate morale and the public's regard for Lee. After the Seven Days Battle and until the end of the war, his men simply called him Mars Robert, uh, a term of respect and affection. The setback to McClellan uh, and the resulting drop in the Union morale impelled Lincoln to adopt a new policy now of relentless committed warfare. Meanwhile, Lee defeated another Union army under General John Pope at the Second Battle of Bull Run. And in less than 90 days after taking command, Lee had run McClellan off the peninsula, defeated Pope, and moved the battle lines from six miles outside of Richmond to within 20 miles outside of Washington, D.C. So his prominence in the South uh, just continued to, to, to gain and gain uh, all the way through the remainder of the war. Number five, turning point. Battle of Antietam, also known as the Battle of Sharpsburg, was fought on September 17, 1862, near Sharpsburg, Maryland, along the Antietam Creek. It was part of the Maryland Campaign. It was the first field uh, army level engagement in the Eastern Theater of the American Civil War to take place on Union soil and is the bloodiest, of course, bloodiest single day of uh, uh, battle in American history with a combined tally of uh, killed, wounded, and, and missing of 22,717. At dawn on the morning of September 17th, Major General Joseph Hooker's Corps mounted a powerful assault on Lee's left flank. Attacks and counterattacks would sweep across the Miller's cornfield and fighting swirled around the Duncan Church. Union assaults uh, against the sunken road eventually pierced the Confederate center, but the uh, Federal advantage wasn't followed up, and in the afternoon, Union Major General Ambrose Burnside's Corps entered the action, capturing a, a stone bridge over the Antietam Creek and advancing against the Confederate right. At a crucial moment in the battle, uh, Major General A.P. Hill's division arrived from Harper's Ferry and launched a surprise counterattack, driving back Burnside and there ending the battle on September 17th. Although outnumbered two to one, Lee committed his entire force while uh, McClellan, in charge of the Army of the Potomac, sent in less than three quarters of his army, enabling Lee to fight the Federals to a standstill. During that night, both armies uh, began consolidating their line. Now, McClellan had halted Lee's invasion of Maryland as a result of this battle, but Lee was able to withdraw his army back to Virginia without interference from the cautious George McClellan. McClellan's refusal to pursue Lee's army led to the removal uh, from command by President Abraham Lincoln of McClellan in November uh, of that year. Now, although the battle was tactically inconclusive, the Confederate troops had withdrawn first from the battlefield. Therefore, in military terms, it was a Union victory. And it was a sufficiently uh, significant victory to give Abraham Lincoln the confidence to announce his Emancipation Proclamation uh, on September 22nd which of course became effective on January 1st, 1863. That Emancipation Proclamation discouraged the British and the French governments from pursuing any potential plans to recognize the Confederacy. President Lincoln was, was, was very disappointed in, in McClellan, uh, McClellan's performance. He believed McClellan's overly cautious and poorly coordinated actions in the field had forced the battle to a draw. Uh, rather than crippling the Confederate army. The president was even more astonished that from September 17th until October 26th, more than a month, despite repeated entreaties from the War Department and the president himself, McClellan declined to pursue Lee across the Potomac River, citing shortages of equipment and the fear of overextending his forces. Uh, Lincoln famously res responded to that saying, Will you pardon me for asking what the horses of your army have done since the Battle of Antietam that fatigued anything? Of course, he would go out to uh, meet with McClellan uh, on the battlefield. Antietam is considered a turning point of the war for me because it was a victory for the Union, but also it ended Lee's strategic campaign, his first invasion of the Union, ter of, of Union territory. It staved off uh, European in, uh, intervention 
and it gave Lincoln the opportunity uh, to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Number six, turning point in my mind of the uh, turn of the Civil War is the death of Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson. Jackson born, of course, January 21st of 1824. In 1842, he had accepted a uh, had been accepted into the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York. Now he had Jackson had uh, somewhat inadequate schooling up to that point, uh, and therefore had difficulty with the entrance examination, and began his studies at the bottom of the class. Displaying a dogged determination uh, that was to characterize his life, he became one of the hardest working cadets in the academy and moved up steadily in the academic standings. Uh, and at time of graduation in that uh, famed class of 1846, he graduated 17 out of 59. Uh, it was said by his peers there that if he had stayed there another year, he probably would have graduated first in the class. Jackson begins his United States Army career as a second lieutenant in the 1st United States Artillery Regiment, was sent uh, to fight in the Mexican-American War uh, from 1846 to 1848. In the spring of 1851, Jackson accepts a uh, newly created teaching position at the Virginia Military Institute uh, in Lexington, Virginia. He became the professor of natural and experimental philosophy, as well as an instructor of artillery. Jackson was an extremely unpopular teacher and was an extremely poor teacher as well. The students called him Tom Fool. Uh, he would uh, sit in his home on a, on a, a chair uh, facing a wall uh, and review his uh, lesson plans for the following day. Uh, he would then get up into his class and recite them verbatim uh, to his class the next day. Any student that was uh, came to ask for help was given the same explanation as before. And if they interrupted him during his recitation of, of the, uh, the class that day, he would simply start over. However, when the war began, uh, Jackson soon rose to the, rose to the top. Uh, he rose to prominence and earned the famous nickname of uh, Stonewall at that first battle of uh, Bull Run as they indicated on uh, July 21st. In the spring of 1862, Jackson was ordered by Richmond uh, to operate in the, in the Shenandoah Valley uh, to try to, to defeat uh, General Banks' threat and prevent McDowell's uh, troops from reinforcing McClellan. And that began actually a uh, interaction with Robert E. Lee. Uh, Jackson was officially under the command of uh, General uh, Joe Johnson, uh, but Johnson had his hands full uh, on the peninsula. And so as a result of that, uh, uh, Jefferson Davis's uh, chief military advisor, Robert Lee, uh, started his communications with Jackson and uh, pretty much was able, he and Jackson were able to, to start working on uh, Jackson's different plans. Jackson possessed the uh, attributes to succeed. He was a combination of uh, great audacity like Lee, he had excellent knowledge and shrewd use of the terrain. And he also had an uncommon ability to inspire his troops to great feats of marching and fighting. His campaign in the Valley of 1862 was a classic military campaign <coughs> of uh, surprise and, and maneuver. He pressed his army to travel <coughs> ultimately 646 miles in 48 days. He won five significant victories, including battles at Fort Royal, Winchester, and Cross Keys. <coughs> he had a force of about 17,000 against a combined force of 60,000. Stonewall Jackson, as a result of this, became the most celebrated soldier in the Confederacy until ultimately being eclipsed by Lee. And Jackson's actions <coughs> lifted the morale of the Southern public. His troops served well under Lee in a series of battles known as the Seven Days Battle, although Jackson's own performance in June and July of 1862 uh, was generally considered to be poor and left much to be desired. But at the Second Battle of uh, Bull Run, uh, Jackson had a surprise attack uh, and uh, helped defeat the army under the command of General Pope. <coughs> at the Battle of uh, Chancellorsville, 
although outnumbered by the Union forces, Lee decided to employ a risky tactic to take the initiative and offensive away from uh, General Joseph Hooker's new Southern thrust against the Army of Northern Virginia. Lee decided to divide his forces. Jackson and his entire corps went on a very aggressive flanking maneuver to the right of the, United, of the Union line. That flanking movement was the most successful and dramatic of the war and has been studied ever since. In fact, when the first uh, Gulf War, uh, Norman Schwarzkopf would, would uh, uh, use that same tactic uh, in defeating uh, the, uh, the forces uh, in the first, war, first, uh, first Gulf War. Having decided, having met with Lee and decided to do about the flank attack, Jackson returned to his corps, arranged his divisions into the line of battle, uh, led them there, and then charged directly into the oblivious uh, federal right. Uh, darkness had ended the assault, and as Jackson and his staff were returning to camp on May 2nd after having gone out to do some scouting, uh, they were mistaken for a Union cavalry force by the 18th North Carolina Infantry, who shouted, Hall, who goes there? But they fired before uh, receiving the reply. Uh, frantic shouts by uh, Jackson's staff identifying the party were replied by Major John Bar Barry with the retort, it's a damn Yankee trick, fire. Second volley was fired in response. Uh, in all, Jackson would be hit by three bullets, two in his left arm and one in his right hand. <clears throat> Jackson's left arm had to be amputated by his uh, physician, Dr. Hunter McGuire. Uh, he was then moved to Thomas Chandler's 740-acre plantation named Fairfield. He was offered Chandler's home for recovery, but Jackson refused and suggested that uh, he use the plantation office building instead. Uh, at one point, he was thought to be out of harm's way, but unknown to the doctors, he had already had classic symptoms of pneumonia and had been complaining of a sore chest. Uh, Lee would write to Jackson after learning of Jackson's injuries, uh, stating that could I have directed events, I would have chosen for the good of the country to be disabled in your state. Jackson died of complications from pneumonia on May 10th, 1863. His body was then moved to the governor's mansion in Richmond uh, for a public to mourn, and then moved to be buried in the Stonewall Jackson Memorial Cemetery in Lexington, Virginia. The arm that had been amputated uh, on May 2nd was buried separately by Jackson's uh, chaplain, Beverly Tucker Lacey, at the uh, Horace Lacey house known as Elwood. Upon hearing of, of Jackson's death, Lee mourned the loss of both a friend and a trusted commander. As Jackson lay dying, Lee sent a message to Chaplain Lacey saying, to General Jackson, my affection regards and say to him, he has lost his left arm, but I am my right. The night that Lee learned of Jackson's death, he took, told his cook, William, I've lost my right arm and I'm bleeding at the heart. Thomas Jackson was greatly admired and respected throughout the South, and his death had a profound effect on civilians and soldiers alike. The impact on Northern Virginia was the uh, Reorganization, the almost immediate reorganization of the Army of Northern Virginia from two corps to three corps, ultimately leading it then to Gettysburg and uh, the uh, defeat, Confederate defeat there. Uh, also, as a result of Jackson's, defeat, uh, Jackson's death, uh, Lee no longer had the striking force of the Army of Northern Virginia that uh, Jackson's Corps had been. July of 1863, uh, I think, is a major turning point of the Civil War. The two battles, uh, two events, military events, the Battle of Gettysburg ending on July 3rd and the fall of the Siege of uh, Vicksburg on July 4th. The Union reaction to the news of victory at Gettysburg, the news of, uh, electrified the North. The headlines were in the Philadelphia Inquirer proclaimed, Victory, Waterloo eclipsed. New York diarist George Templeton Strong wrote, the results of this victory are priceless. The charm of Robert E. Lee's invincibility is broken. The Army of the Potomac is at last found a general that can handle and has stood nobly up to its terrible work in spite of its long, disheartening list of heart fought failures. Copperheads are palsied and dumb for the moment, at least. Government is strengthened fourfold at home and abroad. The defeat of the, at Gettysburg uh, on, on the effect on the Confederacy uh, 
they had lost militarily and politically. Uh, during the final hours of the Battle of Gettysburg, Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens had been approaching Union lines in Norfolk, Virginia, under a flag of truce. Although his formal instructions from uh, Confederate President Jefferson Davis uh, limited his powers to negotiate on prisoner exchanges uh, and other procedural matters. Uh, historian James McPherson from Princeton speculates that uh, uh, Alexander Stevens had informal goals of presenting peace overtures uh, to the uh, Lincoln administration. Davis had hoped that Stevens would reach Washington from the south while Lee's victorious army was marching toward it from the north. Lincoln, upon hearing of Get the Gettysburg results, refused Stevens' request to pass through the lines. Furthermore, when the news reached London, any lingering hopes of European recognition of the Confederacy were finally abandoned. Henry Adams wrote, the disasters of the rebels are unredeemed by even any hope of success. It is now conceded that all idea of intervention is at an end. Compounding those effects of the, de of the defeat at Gettysburg uh, was the end of the siege of Vicksburg, uh, which rendered uh, Grant's federal armies in the West on July 4th. Grant's hard won, uh, hard won advance on Vicksburg in May of 1863 had been a strategic masterpiece. On May 1st, his army crossed the Mississippi River uh, south of Vicksburg, and with Confederate forces unclear of his intentions, Grant sent a portion of his army under uh, General uh, Sherman to capture the state capital at Jackson, while also setting his sights on Vicksburg and a view for permanently closing the Confederate supply base. When initial assaults on the city demonstrated uh, the strength of, of Vicksburg's defenses, the Union Army was then forced to uh, lay siege on the city. And finally, after a 46 day <coughs> siege, uh, digging trenches and lobbing uh, or shells, Confederate General John Pemberton uh, finally surrendered his 30,000 man army uh, to Grant. Coupled with a Northern victory in Gettysburg, capture Vicksburg marks the turning point of the war as it splits the Confederacy in two and gave the Union complete control now of the Mississippi River. Of course, the uh, commander of the, uh, of the Army of uh, Northern, of, uh, Army of the Potomac uh, at uh, Gettysburg was uh, George Meade, who had been appointed on uh, June 28th and uh, fought the biggest battle of the war uh, only three days later and was uh, Lee's commander of the Army of Northern Virginia at Vicksburg. We have Pemberton and, and uh, Grant, both of the both commanders of the army. <coughs> Number eight, turning point. Failure of the Confederate in, uh, Southern in infrastructure, uh, particularly the railroads. Logistics in the Civil War uh, is mostly overlooked. Uh, I, I think it's, it, it, it cries out for a, a detailed study uh, to, to be accomplished, um, it's ripe for, for, for that study, uh, for, for the logistics, not only in moving manpower, but also in supplying uh, forces in the field. Southern transportation had relied uh, primarily upon the railroad, as did the North. However, the railroads uh, were ill-equipped to handle the demands that were placed on them during the war. There were physical shortcomings of the railroads and they were exacerbated by poor leadership, military setbacks and a misplaced philosophy that the majority of Southerners espoused, which was states right. <clears throat> in the 1860s, Southern railroads consisted of about 9,000 miles of track. Uh, counter that with the North, which had about 20,000 miles of track. Gauge differences in the rails were uh, rampant. Uh, terminus operations uh, retarded the swift movement of troops and supplies. In every major terminus in the South, except for Atlanta, there were no interconnecting tracks. At each term terminus there, there had to be two sets of trains, identical in composition, and they had to be this at the same time, the same place, in order to achieve timely transfer of war material. The North could call on almost 4,000 locomotives at the beginning of the world, while the South only had 732. Also, at the beginning of the war, the Union owned 96% of the United States uh, Railroad equipment. Uh, and during the war, the Confederate 
train size averaged only 10 cars per train with about 50 to 60 soldiers per car. To be sure, the Southern rail system had 11 different gauges of rails. Uh, the rail quality also differed widely. Most of the rails that had been laid in, 18, in the 1850s were of light construction. And by the 1860s, the maintenance problems drastically increased with the traffic volume and train weight that caused problems. Uh, there only had one east-west line that connected the eastern seaboard with the Mississippi River. <laughs> the South also possessed neither the industrial base necessary to expand uh, or to repair this system. In order to overcome that, the centralized control would have to be exerted on the companies, but that's incompatible with states' rights theories. States were not going to be uh, kowtowing to the federal uh, Confederate uh, government on that issue. Jefferson Davis, realizing this problem, wrote to his Congress on January 12th of 1863, outlining the problems. Congress gave him the power, but those powers weren't utilized until early 1865, and by then it was too late. Union forces began massive operations of destruction uh, aimed at the Southern railroads. They became the prime targets of Union cavalry. Uh, in fact, what they would test would do would be to tie up the rails, uh, heat them up, and then wrap them around uh, poles or trees. Uh, it got to the point in 1864, they would call them Sherman, Sherman's bow ties uh, to, to, to wreck them up. By 1863, the Confederates were unable to rapidly deploy uh, their forces as a result of the use of rails and the inability to use the rails. The Battle of Chickamauga demonstrates that. Uh, the plan had called for the movement of uh, James Longstreet's first corps of the Army of Northern Virginia with 15,000 men to move them from Richmond to Tennessee in order to reinforce Braxton Bragg's army. This movement by Longstreet began on September 8th uh, it was going to cover approximately 750 miles. On September 19th, 11 days later, Longstreet was able to attack with only 7,000 men. He had neither his baggage trains nor his artillery with him. It wasn't until uh, six days later on September 25th that the artillery arrived with the rest of his troops. Transfer of his men at that point to that uh, average just four miles per hour. Contrast that in the winter of 1863, Lincoln ordered Union Army reinforcements of 25,000 men and 10 batteries of cannon to join the battle in Chattanooga, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. The troops covered the 600 mile distance in only 11 days. Before the outbreak of the war, the average train speed in the, in the South was 20 miles per hour. By 1862, it was down to seven miles per hour. By 1863, it was down to four miles per hour. Uh, and in 1864, it was two and a half miles an hour. In 1865, you could walk faster than the trains were operating. By September of 1863, the South was unable to concentrate large forces for the remainder of the Civil War, in spite of the desire to use the internal line. And that has resulted in the failure of that Confederate infrastructure. Uh, in large part, I think, uh, the, uh, the inability of the South to properly be able to uh, use the, the railroads, uh, replace the rail railroads, uh, contributed almost as, as much as any other thing uh, to the defeat of, of the Confederacy. Hiram Ulysses Grant, born on April 27th, 1822. Graduates 21st uh, out of 39 cadets in the West Point class of 1843. Uh, he performed well as a captain during the Mexican War. He received two, two citations for gallantry and one for meritorious conduct. Yet, uh, by 1854, Grant has to uh, resign from the United States Army uh, to avoid being drummed out of the service, uh, probably uh, those that, uh, because of his. Uh, fondness for alcohol. He would spend the next six years in St. Louis, Missouri uh, with his wife, Julia. Uh, when the war began in 1861, 
uh, Grant jumps at a choice, to, to a chance to volunteer for military service in the Union Army. And his first command would be as the Colonel of the 21st Illinois Infantry. By 1862, he'd been promoted to General and had triumphs at uh, Fort Henry and Fort Donelson in Western Tennessee, that won him the nickname of Unconditional Surrender Grant, U.S. Grant. When a surprise attack, Confederate attack uh, at the uh, Battle of Shiloh uh, yielded devastating casualties on that first day, uh, President Abraham Lincoln received several demands for Grant's removal from the command. Nevertheless, <clears throat> Lincoln refused stating, I can't spare this man, he fights. The following day, April 7, 1862, Grant's army bolstered as they indicated before by uh, Major General Don Carlos Buell's army. They fended off the Confederate advances and ultimately win the day. His hard earned victory at Vicksburg and uh, the uh, siege of Vicksburg uh, was also uh, been determined to be a strategic masterpiece. After the Confederate defeat at Chattanooga, uh, President Lincoln promoted Grant to a special regular army rank called the General in Chief or Lieutenant General. That was authorized by Congress on March 2nd, 1864. That rank had previously uh, been awarded only two other times, the full rank to George Washington and the brevet rank to Winfield uh, Scott. Grant would then move his headquarters uh, from the west to the east and installed Major General William Sherman uh, as the commander of the Western Army. President Lincoln and Grant then met, met together in Washington and devised a total war plans uh, that struck at the heart of the Confederacy. Uh, and they included military, railroad, and economic infrastructures going after those. The two primary objectives of Grant's uh, overall plan was to defeat Lee's Army of uh, Northern Virginia and Joseph Johnson's Army of Tennessee. Union forces would strike the Confederacy from multiple directions. Uh, the Union Army of the Potomac, led by uh, George Meade, uh, accompanied by U.S. Grant, uh, would attack Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Benjamin Butler would attack south of Richmond uh, from the James River. Sherman uh, would attack Johnson's Army in Georgia. And George Crook and uh, William Averill uh, would destroy railroad supply lines in West Virginia. Nathaniel Banks is, was supposed to be tasked with capturing Mobile, Alabama, and Franz Siegel was to guard the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad and advance up the Shenandoah Valley. Uh, Grant would command all the Union uh, Army forces while, as I indicated, being in the field with Meade and the Army of the Potomac. Grant's bulldog tenacity uh, would ensure uh, an ultimate Union victory. That came evident uh, to Lincoln uh, and uh, his cabinet when uh, the uh, wilderness campaign, uh, at one point early in the wilderness campaign, uh, when there had been vicious fighting. Uh, in the past, every time there had been vicious fighting, uh, the Army of the Potomac would disengage uh, and uh, remove itself. Uh, instead, they, the soldiers were watching, which, what would Grant do? And would he turn uh, right, heading north and disengaging, or would he return? left uh, and uh, on, onward to Richmond. And that's what he did. And he sent word back to, to uh, Lincoln that he would fight it out on that line if we take all summer. Lincoln was then able to know that he had uh, the right channel. Number 10 on my uh, top 10 uh, turning points of the Civil War, the fall of Atlanta. There were five telegraphic words, General Sherman is taking Atlanta. That thrilled the nation uh, in September of 1864. With that splendid achievement, one half of the great campaign of the summer was finished and the seal of success already set upon the military operations in the year of 1864. Considering simply the military results of Sherman's campaign in the first place, it was it worsted and, and nearly destroyed the second army of the Confederacy. At once the uh, workshop, the, uh, the granary, the storehouse, uh, the arsenal of the Confederacy, Atlanta, uh, and its environs were of incalculable value. Uh, the foundries and the furnaces and the rolling mills, uh, the factories for cannon, small arms, 
powder, cartridges, cushion caps, uh, ambulances, harnesses, shoes, all were accumulated at Atlanta. Uh, and that all was now captured uh, by uh, Sherman's forces uh, in September of 1864. Uh, Atlanta was, the, set, was the, uh, the, the center of the network of towns and villages. Uh, and they furnished the uh, fourth half of the war materials for the entire Confederacy from the Rappahannock to the Rio Grande. Uh, that valuable re region was now uh, under the hands of Sherman and Union forces. It had been a bleak summer of 1864 for uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, the best political minds of the time thought that Lincoln's reelection chances were slim, including Lincoln himself. Uh, the year had been especially brutal for Union forces. Uh, even compared to enormous losses uh, the previous year, and the armies were stalled outside of Petersburg, Virginia, and Atlanta, Georgia. It was doubtful whether uh, any military victory could be attained before the Northern public gave up on the war, uh, and that made Lincoln's electoral defeat appear certain. Uh, given the peace platform of Lincoln's opponents, including the Democratic uh, candidate for uh, president in the presidential election of 1864, George McClellan, uh, his loss uh, might mean the death of the Union itself and the perpetuation of, of uh, American slavery, as well as the faulting of the democracy prospects around the world. So uh, in early or uh, mid uh, August of 1864, uh, Lincoln uh, drafted a letter uh, that essentially said that uh, if it, uh, he, he lost the election in November, that before the, uh, the inauguration of McClellan in March of 1865, all the members of the cabinet would try to cooperate uh, to bring a, a, a conclusion to the war before McClellan took, uh, took office. Uh, he put that letter in the envelope, sealed the envelope, and had his uh, cabinet members sign it without knowing the, the contents of it. And yet, as a result, on September 2nd, 1864, Atlanta surrenders to uh, Sherman, and that uh, immediately converts Lincoln's prospects from defeat, almost a victory overnight, uh, and as a result of that. Uh, and so that brings to, uh, to uh, a conclusion, once Lincoln is uh, re-elected, uh, my, my belief that as long as uh, Abraham Lincoln was uh, president in the White House, <laughs> there was no way that the Union would capitulate uh, to the Confederate States of America. So th those are my top 10 folks. Um, uh, everyone, can certainly be able to do their own, uh, should do their own, uh, mix and match. Uh, I'm sure that uh, some, of one, some of the ones that I went over tonight, uh, people were uh, perhaps scratching their heads saying, well, but what's with that? Uh, and I'm also sure that there are some that uh, everybody uh, would agree would be uh, part, of, part of, the, of the top 10 points of the Civil War. Uh, so with that, it's a conclusion uh, of my presentation. Would you, uh, would you here's, the, here's the end of my presentation. Jay, would you take down your screen share, please? Yes. Okay, Gar is here and he, he got a few questions uh, for you. We've, we've had a couple and if anybody else out there has a question, please use the chat feature and go ahead and, and send us your question. Uh, first one we had, uh, what did uh, General Dan Sykes, uh, or Sickles rather, do to disparage General Meade at Gettysburg? Uh, Sickles was, uh, General Sickles was the only uh, non-West Point uh, commander, a uh, corps commander of the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg uh, and had been a, 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 a good friend of uh, Joseph Hooker and not a good friend of uh, George Gordon Meade. Uh, Sickles was in charge of the Third Corps at the, uh, of, of the Army of the Potomac at Gettysburg, uh, extended his line uh, from his original line to a line that was untenable. And as a result of that, uh, his third corps got, got badly manhandled. But uh, during that activity, uh, Sickles was, was wounded. Uh, his leg had to be amputated as a result of a cannon, cannonball going through his horse, taking, uh, 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 causing his, his leg to be uh, removed. Sickles immediately was removed from the battlefield after the amputation uh, and got to, to Washington and was one of the first people that uh, was able to meet with Lincoln and, and tell Lincoln about the Battle of, uh, of uh, Gettysburg. Uh, and uh, his, his account to Lincoln 
was uh, amazingly highly complimentary of Dan Sickles uh, and was highly uh, against uh, George Gordon Reed. So that's what uh, that's what he, that's what he, he did there. Hi, uh, another question here. Vicksburg was a turning turning point in the West. Do you agree? I do agree with that. Uh, that, uh, that that freed up the entire uh, Mississippi River uh, for the Union forces. Uh, Lincoln Lincoln thought of it as, as being the turning point uh, in the West as well. It uh, kind of splits the Confederacy, uh, and uh, I, I definitely would, would agree with that. Um, a question from me. Uh, for Vicksburg certainly was because it, it, they lost the whole Mississippi at that point. Didn't that really get its start back uh, early in 62 when uh, Grant took Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson? Well, Fort Henry and Fort Donaldson is on the, on the Tennessee River. Right. Uh, and uh, then he continues heading on the Tennessee River, of course. Uh, for, for Shiloh in, in April of, of 62. Um, but they were having a, a, a extremely difficult time uh, taking control and getting, getting past uh, the fortress, really what, what uh, Vicksburg was a fortress, uh, and, and stopped any Union, Union uh, naval attempts uh, coming from the north and passing it. Uh, and ultimately, they, they, they ran it. So, uh, Fort Don Henry and Donaldson uh, was important because it, 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 it shines a light uh, on Grant uh, and uh, certainly could, could, could contribute to that. Yes. Uh, I, I have one other question for you. Uh, you spoke about Lee taking command, and that's when Joe Johnston was wounded at Fair Oaks, the Battle of Fair Oaks. Uh, yes. What do you see as, as what might have happened differently had Johnston not been wounded and had remained in command? Uh, Johnson, Johnson, Joe Johnson had a knack for um, retrograde movements, um, fancy way of saying retreat. Uh, he just didn't seem to uh, believe that uh, he had the capabilities, uh, his, his, his army had capabilities of, of standing and fighting. And so I think what would have uh, occurred would be that uh, uh, McClellan would have started that glacial-like, continued that glacial-like uh, movement towards Richmond, and Johnson would have uh, retreated back into uh, the uh, defenses of Richmond, thereby uh, creating a, a similar situation to Vicksburg, that it would be a, a siege of Richmond itself. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the war, I think, is, is over maybe in 63, as opposed to two years after that. All right. Do we have any other questions uh, that someone has? Let's look at the chat. And uh, we're not seeing any more. Okay. So we still have uh, a group sitting here watching. I uh, want to thank them all for attending. And Jay, I certainly want to thank you for the talk. Uh, we will be uh, putting it up on our YouTube channel uh, and Facebook. Uh, yeah. And uh, certainly uh, we'll notify uh, members when that's up. But Jay, I also let you know when it goes up. Thank you. So, and thank you. if you want to watch yourself, You'll be able to see it. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you all. I, I greatly appreciate the, the offer and the, and the uh, being able to make a presentation to your spectacular roundtable. Uh, it, it's been a great honor of mine. Uh, thank you all very much. All right. Thanks. Uh, we sure enjoyed your Take care. Take care.